This is Radio Health Journal. I'm Nancy Benson. This week, cyclic vomiting syndrome. It sounds like a messy nightmare, but what is it really? There are even some kids that vomit more than 400 times per episode. It's a horrific vomiting. What it's like to continuously vomit for days at a time when Radio Health Journal continues. I'm Reed Pence, host of Radio Health Journal. If you enjoy Radio Health Journal, you'll also like Viewpoints, our sister show covering current affairs. This week on Viewpoints. This kind of opportunity should absolutely be offered to all students. You know, we don't have an advanced placement citizen. Teaching the best ways to foster political discussion in the classroom. Then, grit, the role that passion and perseverance play in success in life. All that and more this week on Viewpoints. Listen to Viewpoints on your favorite radio station, iTunes, and Stitcher. Just about everyone feels nauseated every now and then. Whether it's food poisoning or a stomach bug, we'll do anything to stop that queasy sensation. Unfortunately, a lot of the time, vomiting is the only path to feeling better. But imagine throwing up every 10 minutes for days on end. For Molly, this nightmare started as a baby. It wasn't until a decade later that a doctor recognized her symptoms and gave her mother a diagnosis of cyclic vomiting syndrome, a disease that's relatively unknown, difficult to treat, and severely impacts quality of life. This would happen every six to eight weeks. She would start vomiting then once we got her tucked back in bed and start about every five to ten minutes she would have a vomit and then she may do that for an hour or so and then rest for maybe an hour or so and then wake up and would start the vomiting again. Her length of an episode was two and a half days generally, sometimes three. That's Kathleen Adams, Molly's mother and the founder, president and research liaison of the Cyclic Vomiting Syndrome Association. Dizziness, intense nausea, thirst, Molly did not have headaches or belly aches, but some people with CVS do, so they're plagued with pain and nausea and vomiting. And that would turn on like a light switch first thing in the morning, kaboom. And after she was finished, it would turn off like a light switch, and she would be ready for her most frequent request was a little cheeseburger. For 11 years, Kathleen could not solve the mystery behind her daughter's continuous vomiting. But after finally finding a doctor who knew what was happening, Molly started to improve. He was able to medicate her with the most commonly used medication still to this day for cyclic vomiting syndrome, which is amitriptyline or Elevil, as it's known to the public, an old antidepressant, which is also used for chronic pain and migraine. So Molly, within a few months, started getting less episodes, less intense And gradually, over the next five years or so into adolescence, the episodes got much, much better. And they evolved then into a migraine headache, which this is kind of a common textbook picture of the disease that Molly has. Today, Kathleen is devoted to spreading the word about cyclic vomiting syndrome. Dr. B. Lee is a professor of pediatrics and the director of the cyclic vomiting program at the Medical College of Wisconsin. essentially are recurrent spells of vomiting, and they're usually very severe, and they cause a child or adult the inability to walk or talk even, so they are completely out of it. They vomit to the point of dehydration, end up in emergency rooms, and very much look like they had the worst case of food poisoning or stomach flu, except that it keeps happening over and over and over again. So 10 times in a year would not be atypical for this. While some people may underestimate the disease, Lee argues that it's no joke. These go on at least several hours. Our average is 24 to 48 hours, and we have some outliers at about 10 days. So it can be very prolonged, but it usually will stop on its own eventually. And there are even some kids that vomit more than 400 times per episode. Researchers say episodes can be triggered by stress, lack of sleep, prolonged fasting, even by an exciting event. For patients and caretakers, learning about and avoiding common triggers can make CVS more manageable. 
However, Lee says many people suffer for too long because the medical community is largely unaware of the condition. He says that patients are repeatedly misdiagnosed and not taken seriously by doctors. We still encounter children who, for example, have not been properly diagnosed for 10 years. And they've been going through this in and out of emergency rooms for 10 years with other kinds of diagnoses, psychiatric, recurrent stomach flu, etc. And more often it's, well, I think it's in your head. While CVS is certainly a very real disorder, it's correct that the origins appear to be neurological. Lee says family history shows a pattern that is key to figuring out what causes the syndrome. About 80-some percent of the children have somebody or themselves, but usually somebody else in the family that has migraine headaches. There are also, when we mine the family tree further, there tend to be members with a number of other things, including anxiety, depression. They have a disorder called postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, where they get faint, lightheaded when they stand up quickly. They can have sleep disorders, irritable bowel syndrome. So when you look at the family trees, you find a lot of other what we call functional disorders. Treatments for the syndrome exist, but once the vomiting starts, little can be done except to head to the hospital. There, IV fluids help with dehydration, while anti-nausea meds and sedation slow down the vomiting. To avoid the hospital stay, preventive drugs help to reduce the rate of episodes. In little children, we use something called ciproheptadine, and that's used for many different conditions. It has some allergy, anti-allergic properties, but it's also used for different vomiting disorders. It tends to help as a prophylactic in young children. In older children, we use amitriptyline, but there's also anti-seizures drugs that may work for this disorder. That's Dr. Katya Kovacic, a pediatric gastroenterologist at the Children's Hospital of Wisconsin. She says most children eventually outgrow cyclic vomiting by adolescence, as it often transforms into migraine headaches. For the small number of adults with CVS, the syndrome is more severe. Anxiety disorders affect about half of all people with CVS, and a lack of stamina, dizziness, sleep disorders, and limb pain are also common. Even when they're well, they are not quite well. They are still afflicted, especially, for example, with limited stamina. So exercise, they can't keep up with their peers is the basic challenge that they face. So they face other challenges that we didn't recognize before, and we have done studies on what we call quality of life, and they are as bad as anybody with Crohn's disease or what we would consider organic gastrointestinal disease. Cyclic vomiting syndrome can be managed, but it's traumatic to live with and care for. Thankfully, it's rare. For the vast majority of us, feeling nauseated is simply a product of something we ate. You can find out more about the Cyclic Vomiting Syndrome Association at cvsaonline.org or through a link on our webpage, radiohealthjournal.net. Our writer this week is Amira Zaveri. Our production directors are Sean Waldron and Nick Hofstra. I'm Nancy Benson. Medical notes this week. Doctors may have a lot more time to respond to strokes than they thought. Studies in the New England Journal of Medicine show that with quick brain scans to pinpoint stroke locations, doctors may have as long as 24 hours after a stroke to administer clot-busting drugs. Previously, doctors believed they had only six hours to act. The results of the studies are reflected in new stroke treatment guidelines issued by the American Heart Association and the American Stroke Association, and experts say they could save thousands of lives and disabilities per year. Ever wonder why we have a gut feeling to trust some people and not others? It could have to do with how much they look like people we've known in the past. A study in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences finds that if someone even remotely resembles someone who's burned us in the past, we're unlikely to trust them. And if they resemble someone who's done well by us in the past, we're more likely to think they're okay. And finally, evidence that sugar comas are real A study in the journal Physiology and Behavior finds that people's cognitive performance and attention are impaired after they consume sugar, especially simple sugars like glucose. And the effect is especially bad if people haven't eaten in a while. And that's Medical Notes this week. Thank you for listening to Radio Health Journal, a production of MediaTracks Communications. If you enjoyed this week's show, please leave a review on iTunes or share it with a friend. 
You can find more Radio Health Journal stories about health, science, and technology on iTunes, Stitcher, and at RadioHealthJournal.net.